we've been doing a rather long prayer for the Advent season, and it's a prayer for really ourselves in the world. And Advent is a time where we take a look at what Christ does in very specific ways. And so the prayer this morning will be up on the screen. All around the world, people live in despair and grasp at whatever might make them feel safe. All over the world, people try to bring some type of meaning to their lives. They lust for power and wealth. They fill their lives with entertainment. They dedicate their lives to achieving personal goals. They seek forgiveness through their own works. They seek life through things like medicine. They seek anything that gives temporary hope. But all fall short of real hope. Father, fill our hearts with your hope. Fill our mouths with the message of your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to give up the things in this world that are worthless and to fill our lives with Christ. In this Christmas season, may people from all realms of life recognize a desperate need for you. All around this world, there's anger and hatred in the human heart. There's war between nations, between ethnicities, between families, and between people. Anger breaks apart families and causes abuse in relationships, divides communities, and polarizes churches. Hatred fuels people to do terrible things in word and in actions. In our own lives, we are angry when we feel we've suffered an injustice, but we fall short of hating the injustice in the world around us. Heavenly Father, we pray for the peace that only Christ can bring. Pray for the end of hatred and war, of bruises and pain, of hurtful words and often unrecognized injustice. Instead, this Christmas season, we pray for your kingdom of peace. When Christ shall come again and bring lasting peace to this world and to our hearts. All around this world, broken people fill their lives with things that bring them joy for a moment. People dive into lust, addictions, material wealth, and other things that bring momentary happiness, but ultimately hurt themselves and others. People take joy in things that are sinful and wrong, like the pain of other people, and refuse to take joy in what is good and right. All people, including ourselves, often confuse what we should take joy in and fill our lives with the joy of sin instead of things that are good and pleasing to God. Heavenly Father, we pray that our lives are full of good things, basic necessities, healthy relationships, your forgiveness and grace. We pray that we take joy not only in these things, but in all good things you give to us. In this Christmas season, Open our eyes to the sinful things that we delight in and teach us to take joy in your blessings, especially the gift of salvation. Heavenly Father, all across this world, people are confused and do not know what to love and how to love. Parents abandon children, spouses abandon each other, and friends abandon friends. People love selfishly instead of selflessly. We love objects instead of people. We love ourselves more than others. We seek love that isn't actually love. Heavenly Father, fill our hearts with your true gift of love. Take the blinders off our hearts and our eyes. Help us to love that which you call us to love. Help us to love selflessly, passionately, and consistently each and every day. In this Christmas season, help us to reflect your love for this world in our words and actions. Lord, in this Advent season, as we see the wonders Christ brought to this world, help us to look ahead with excitement to the coming of his kingdom. Help us to dwell on the things of God and not the sinful things of this world. Help us to shout out, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. I hope these are some of your prayers this Advent season as we journey to Christmas. At this time, I uh, invite the choir to come up and bless us with their ministry of music.
offering this morning is for the general fund. May we give generously as God has given to us. Our scripture reading today is Isaiah 35, Joy of the Redeemed. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendor of Carmen, Carmel, and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, Be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance. With divine retribution, he will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow, and a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor any ravenous beast. They will not be found there. 
but only the redeemed will walk there. And those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sign will flee away. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have given us your word. Send now your Holy Spirit into this place. Open our eyes and our minds so that we understand what you are speaking and help us to write it upon our hearts and to live it faithfully each and every day. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I realize it's winter, so everyone stand up for three seconds. Three seconds, stand up. Shake your feet, move, do what you want to do. Shake someone's hand, give someone a hug, blow someone a kiss, I don't care. You've all been yawning at me all morning. So, all right, now you can sit down. I realize it's winter, it snowed yesterday, it's, it's sort of that time of the year where we can get cranky and the weather sort of acts up on us, but this morning we're going to talk about joy. Uh, this morning we're lighting the joy candle, it's one of the advent candles, and it's the pink candle. It's the candle that's a different color than all the rest. And I don't know, have, has any of you ever thought about that before, why this candle is a different color? I actually don't know why it's a different color. I couldn't figure this out. Um, sorry to disappoint you. But I do know one thing, and maybe this is the reason why it's a different color. Joy is different than any other of the other candle meanings that we have. Christ brings hope to us. Christ is our hope. Christ brings peace. We saw that last week. Christ, next week we'll talk about Christ who teaches us how to love. And of course, the Christ candle is about Jesus Christ. But joy, joy is about what we do. Joy is about us. Okay? What is joy? Joy is an emotional response, or a joy is a feeling of great pleasure or happiness. It's an emotional response to something good or something we think is good. Big difference, by the way. Joy is a response. It's our emotional response to something we like. Something that we think is good and something that we enjoy. Right? When we talk about joy in Jesus, it's sort of the same thing. Joy is supposed to be our reaction to the gospel, to what Christ does. What this means is, number one, it originates in us. It's our response. And number two, it really isn't something you learn. Christ can't teach us joy in many ways. It's literally something we either feel or don't feel when we think about the gospel, which might make this pink candle the hardest of all the four, five candles that are up there. I could talk about joy of the gospel for the next three days, but that doesn't mean you're going to feel joy when you think about it. You just might not. Joy is just an emotional response to something good. And it's supposed to be our response to the good things that Christ brings, right? Grace, hope, love, salvation. Joy is supposed to be our response to all the things that God does. And sometimes it is our response, and sometimes it isn't. Before we get into Isaiah 35 this morning, which is a, a passage of, of joy 
of people having joy in the good things of God, let's have an honest conversation about what we have joy in. What brings us joy in this world? Um, for some people, the answer is nothing. There are people in this world who don't seem to be able to enjoy anything. Amen? I, I think we've come across people like this in our, in our lives. Uh, people who, nothing, they can't seem to celebrate anything. Everything is, has something wrong with it. Right? It's something, something's supposed to be a joyful event and something's not right. Uh, they just can't take joy in anything. The, it's not just the glass is half empty. It's the glass is half empty and it's full of vinegar, right? It's, and it's not, I'm not talking about people who don't smile. Uh, there are people in this world who take joy in many things, who love deeply, who enjoy life. They're just not very smiling. I'm talking about people who just can't seem to enjoy things. Some people are this way because they struggle with things like depression, very real problem in this world. And some people are just this way, I don't know, because they are. Most of us are not like that. Mo most of us enjoy things in this world, right? Uh, our problem, maybe, is we probably enjoy some things we probably shouldn't enjoy. How many of us watch television? Now, here's the real question. How many has watched a television program that probably breaks a few biblical commandments? Yeah, I, yeah I'm, I'm part of that, too. Uh, I have guilty pleasures. But it is interesting how much you watch a television show or a movie where scores of nameless people die, right? Or you cheer when two lead actors finally express their love for each other, or... The television show that glorifies drug manufacturing that's named the top-rated television show of all time. It's interesting how often television and what we watch glorifies things that aren't really that good. And it isn't just television programs. Sometimes we take joy in people's sufferings. Something bad happens to someone and you think they deserved it. Right? Or we really enjoy wealth and, and what money can buy or get us. We enjoy getting new things and throwing out the old. We live for the thrill of new clothes, new shoes, new tools. It's interesting how often the things that bring us joy, though, don't last. How often joy is so short-lived. We watch a television program and it's done. But we live for that short entertainment, that short joy of entertainment. We get something new, and a year later we're looking to replace it. We live for that new, short, that enjoyment for just a little second. In this culture, we have a license to enjoy lust, enjoy violence, enjoy unlimited wealth, to uh, enjoy our beauty, especially when it's more than someone else's, so that we can look down on someone. These short-lived, petty, shallow things we enjoy. And I'm willing to bet that there are things in our own lives this morning that we enjoy to some extent that are short-lived and petty. That doesn't mean that everything that brings us joy is bad. Um, I know most of you pretty well. You enjoy your family. Uh, you thank God for clothes and food. You're pretty content people, which God calls us to be, right? You just enjoy what you have. But if we're honest, despite the good things that God calls us to enjoy, the wonderful things, we probably enjoy quite a few sinful things as well. And if we're honest as Christians, which many of you are, there's things that which should bring us joy, which may not always. How many of us really look forward to a time of prayer in our own lives? How many people really look forward to reading the Bible and diving into Scripture? Or do you find devotions to be 
a chore. Reading scripture and prayer is just something you have to do at the end of a meal to get done. Or something you do at the beginning of the meal and you have to get done so you can eat. Right? It's a chore instead of being something we enjoy. Take a look at joy in this world. And uh, joy is often short-lived. And often we take joy in things we probably shouldn't. Things that aren't even petty things. Some things we take joy in actually even hurt us. Things that really don't have a lot of meaning. And we're not as happy about good things as we probably should. And it isn't that God's blessings or the gospel doesn't matter to us. It's just there's a lot of things we take joy in and sometimes we don't take as much joy in that as we should. The point I'm making is is that if we take a hard look at our lives, uh, what can give us joy is not always what should give us joy. And sometimes what shouldn't bring us joy overshadows what should. And we're not alone in this, by the way. Uh, If you go into the book of Isaiah, Isaiah is preaching, teaching, well, bringing God's word to Israel, Judah, at a time where they had the same problem as us. They were taking joy in things they shouldn't have. They lived even in times of fear. You may have sort of gotten that sense from our passage, right? They lived in fear of other nations and destruction and powerful enemies. It's hard to be joyful in times of fear, right? They might celebrate this birthday, but their enemies are breathing down their neck. So it's always overshadowing their joy. So they live in times where they're screwed up as well. And times when joy is not always near. And this is what Isaiah says to them. This is actually what God says to them. In a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. For it will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. The wicked fools will not go there. No lion will be there, nor any ravenous beast. They will not be found there. It's going to be a place of safety. Imagine living in fear and God promises a place of safety. But only the redeemed will walk there and those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion, the place of God with singing. Overlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them and sorrow and sighing will flee away. To this community, this uh, nation, really, this people who had abandoned God in many ways, that lived in misplaced joy, that lived in this time of fear, God doesn't get angry at them. We know he will send judgment. But even though they aren't doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing, God doesn't say, hey, stop having fun, look at me. What God says is a time is coming when there is going to be salvation in his presence. A time is coming when sin and fear is no longer going to find it. And sorrow and pain and tears are gone. Right? To this community that's living in fear, that's, that's not finding joy. And when they do find joy, it's in all the wrong places. Right? God says, I am going to be the God of salvation and life. And a time is coming when salvation and life will enter this world. And then there is going to be something worth having joy in real, long-lasting joy. And really what Isaiah and God is doing something he does throughout the entire book is he's doing this compare and contrast, right? On, on one hand is this world that isn't always full of joy, where we, what we take joy in fades away so quickly, right? And there's fear and there's, there's pain, And on the other hand, there are the promises of God, these promises of life and salvation, of safety, of an ending of tears and pain. And he's like God's holding up these two choices, and he's going to these people and saying, which one? Which one? Which one's going to give you real joy? When you read Isaiah 35, uh, it's not hard to see that he is talking about Jesus Christ. 
along with, of course, the promises of God to come fully into this world when sin and pain is no longer. But that highway he talks about, that highway of salvation, that's the highway we walk today. Christ has come, Christ has died, Christ has been risen to life thousands of years ago already. The Holy Spirit has been poured out into this world. The Holy Spirit's present in this place. Those who have been blinded by sin can now see Christ and forgiveness. Those who are lost can be found. Those who have no hope can have hope. Those who have only fear and sadness can find Christ where there is peace and love. And we know that one day Christ will come again and and we will sing without restraint, right? That this world will only be full of things to enjoy, good things, no longer sin. But Christ came 2,000 years ago. The cross has happened. There is salvation today. There is real forgiveness for anyone who calls on the name of the Lord. There is life and hope and peace and love and forgiveness and and wonderful, dramatic things for anyone who has faith. And he's here for you today, and he's there for you tomorrow as well. Our faithful God of forgiveness and love is with us always. Christ leads his church and us All these things happen today and tomorrow and next because God is faithful. God gives us this choice every day, every morning, to find joy in these things or to find joy in things that aren't really worth it. I said the application of this sermon is... uh, it's pretty easy to understand. It's, it's go and be joyful, really, is the application of the sermon. Really, it's go and be joyful about the things of God. Go and be joyful for what God has done for us through us by the coming of His Holy Spirit because there is really nothing greater than, than Christ and what Christ can do. For some of you, I know this isn't hard, um, for some of you, joy just comes easy, and, and when you think about the gospel, you, you really respond in joy. For some of you, uh, joy in the gospel may be a little bit more difficult, for whatever reason, and it might be something you have to learn. I know I started saying, I said earlier in the sermon, it's not something you can learn. It is something you can learn. It takes intentionality to learn how to be joyful, doesn't it? To, to, to say, this is a good thing, I'm going to take joy in this and not in this. It takes intentional and, and years to learn it, but you can. But I think for many Christians, it's, the gospel is joyful at times, and as we live with it, that joy sort of becomes less. And the question for us as Christians is, how do we reignite that joy again and again? in the gospel. As I thought about that question, I actually thought about weddings. Yes, this makes sense. Stay with me for a few minutes. Uh, I thought about weddings. Um, I've been to a number of weddings, and I imagine many of you have been to weddings. Yes, no. You can shake your head yes. Hopefully you were at your own wedding. Someone just gave me a smile like, no, I wasn't. Makes me wonder what that story is. Um, Weddings are interesting to me because, of course, you have this couple who's standing in front of people making vows. uh, In in a Christian wedding, it's in a church. What I find lovely about weddings is looking at all the people who are sort of attending. Because often as this couple who is in love with each other, who finds joy in each other's presence, it becomes this infectious joy to other people in the crowd. And you see an 80-year-old couple who've been married 60 years, and they're making doe eyes with each other, right, in the back. And it's just sort of fun to see that. 
right? The joy of the couple who's in love, who's making these vows, has sort of spread throughout, and people are remembering their own relationships, their own joy, and married couples are sort of taking joy in their own marriage again. Amen? It's a wonderful thing. It's one of the reasons why I really enjoy weddings, and and yes, I'm one of those people who cry. So, the same thing happens in a church. When one person has the joy of the gospel, it sort of infects other people. And I thought about people who are new to the gospel. Um, Ashley and I have, have spent time with people who are brand new Christians, who are experiencing the facts that we sort of take for granted sometimes as they're discovering them for the first time. You see their eyes light up. You see it come alive. And you sort of reignite your own joy for what Christ has done in your life. I think that's one of the reasons, by the way, that God calls the church to sort of share the gospel is by going out and sharing the gospel. Not only are we trying to include people into the body of Christ and to share the same gospel as us, but we're relearning that same joy again and again and again. Their joy becomes our joy, and we share what God has done with each other. It's also one of the reasons I think we gather as a community and share what God has done with us. When I hear of what God has done in someone's life, how he has been faithful through times of illness, uh, how he has taught someone through times of strife, how he's been there, and you see that they are just in awe of God and what he can do. It reignites your own joy of the gospel, doesn't it? Amen? That's why God calls us to share with each other what God can do and does do. And together we sort of share joy with each other in the wonders of who God is. It's what it's part of means to be a community in a church is to openly share what God has done in our lives with each other. And then we share the joy of the gospel. This morning we're lighting a candle for joy. And and I said our candles are prayers. Our prayer this morning is that all of us really respond in joy to the gospel. Amen? It's a prayer also that a day will come when Christ returns and all that we have left in this world is things to enjoy. That the sin and whatever pain, sorrow washes away and all that's left is things to enjoy in God's presence. But ultimately, the prayer is the same. It's that we enjoy God. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as you teach us and break into our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit, help us to respond in joy to the amazing things you do in each of our hearts and minds. Help us to respond in joy to your grace your hope, your love, your forgiveness, your salvation, your presence. And Lord, as a church, as a community, help us share your joy with each other. Help us to share your joy with this community, and by that, by we may relearn and reignite the joy in our own lives when it grows dim. And Lord, bring quickly to this world A time when all fear, all pain, all sorrow disappears. And all that is left is us and you. And the good things for us to enjoy forever in your presence. We ask this in the name 
of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's stand and respond in singing to... Here I am to worship. Let's stand and sing.